This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 9th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the Anchorage Daily News editorial board's latest efforts to lay a trap for the PFD. Second, we explain why the ADN news page is only reporting half the story on K-12 spending. And third, we explain why and how Disputes among North Slope producers over facility sharing should be resolved permanently. And now, let's join Michael. Brad comes in every week with what he considers to be probably the top three stories of the week or things that we should focus on as we look at this. Uh, we were just talking about the ADN and some of the uh, the some of the editorial, uh, 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 I guess, choices that they made in this story about the Jennifer Armstrong case. Well, Brad's uh, top three this morning is chock full of editorial choices, I guess we should say. So, Brad, first and foremost, uh, somebody's trying to sell us a bill of goods over there. Uh, what uh, what say you? Where do we start? Well, the ADN had an op-ed uh, this, this weekend. They've, they've, they've fallen into this uh, pattern of publishing uh, their major editorials on the weekend. And, they, and their editorial this weekend... Uh, was on a, uh, uh, a spending cap, and and for the first time that I recall seeing them do it, they endorsed a spending cap. And you know, you, you sit there for just the first second, and you think, oh my gosh, are they becoming, you know, fiscally conservative? Are they becoming fiscally responsible? And then you and then you you know think about it a little bit, read the editorial, and you sort of suddenly realize, or at least I sort of suddenly realized, uh, what was going on. It, it's a it's a regurgitation or or a, a replay of an old proposal by Senator von Imhoff, um, and at any time you're replaying an old von Imhoff uh, proposal, you 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 become immediate or I at least become immediately suspect. Um, what they propose to do is a spending cap that would include a P, include the PFD. So they would set the spending cap in a way that included all unrestricted general fund spending plus whatever is paid for the PFD. And what that does, what when Senator Von Himoff uh, proposed it, what she, what she intended to do was set off a battle between those pushing various levels of or their various types of government spending, capital spending, operating budget spending, statewide spending, and the PFD, it would all, it would, you know, visualize this as an as a martial arts cage match um, uh, with uh, with with various components inside, uh, which would include um, UGF spending on operating and on capital, as well as the PFD. And so you're, and so all of the all of the participants inside would be battling for their share of 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 the of the revenue that's uh, inside. Uh, inside of the spending that's inside the uh, inside the cage. One interesting component of that, or uh, the most important component of that, is is who would be on the outside, the top twenty percent, because you wouldn't have additional revenues as an option. It'd be a, it'd be a distant option, but you wouldn't have additional revenues necessarily inside that cage. You would have the the UGF spending on operating and on capital and on the PF uh, and PFD. 
inside the cage, and then you would have any additional revenues would be outside the cage. So the top 20% who are the ones who would who would be impacted by coming with new revenues or additional revenues or substitute revenues would be sitting outside watching this cage match uh, and wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have any uh, any any dog in the in the in the fight. They they would they could support additional spending for things like K through 12 or additional capital budgets. As Senator Myers talked yesterday, you know, some of the some of the people in the construction industry support additional capital budgets, not because it's good for Alaska, but because it's good for them. Right. Uh, and they could sit outside the cage and and support uh, uh, additional capital spending or additional UGF spending without any risk to themselves that they would have to pay for it because it would be it would be it would be taken out of uh, the PFD. So it looks like. Um, it looks like the the ADN suddenly becomes fiscally conservative, and with headlines that say maybe you know maybe a, uh, a spending cap is the way to go. Maybe that's a way to start down this road. And in fact, the ADN says it, it or the editorial says at one point, uh, you don't need to do anything else. Let's just start with a spending cap uh, and uh, and see how that works, and then we'll worry about some other. Then we'll worry about lay, layering on layering on other stuff. Well. You never get to the other stuff. Once you succeeded in setting up a spending cap that has the PFD inside the inside the inside the cap, you never the, the top twenty percent never has to worry about going to anything else, or the legislature never worries about going to anything else because they'll just keep eating away the PFD using the PFD as the as the revenue to support spending um, um, until if ever uh, they use uh, they use the PFD up. So it's a it's it's a slick uh, uh, use of, <laughs> of something that's current. I mean, you had candidates out there like Will Stepp and, and, and Justin Ruffridge who, who ran on spending caps, right? That's the way to, in, in their view and their argument, that's the way to, uh, that's the way to resolve Alaska's fiscal situation. And you sort of have the ADN leveraging up on that and saying, well, yeah, you're right, guys. Um, great, great solution to the fiscal, to the fiscal solution. Let's set it up. Let's let's set up a, a cage, uh, and uh, and you know, and constrain spending, but let's include the PFD in there uh, to make sure that uh, that uh, uh, we've got a revenue source to to accommodate expanded spending, uh, and right. let the top percent continue to sit on the outside. So, it, it's a it. As I read it, I had uh, I had visions of the old Star Wars episode um, uh, where Admiral Akbar says it's a trap, right? Yeah, it's a trap, right? I mean, no, that's exactly it. And this plays right into the hands of, uh, we saw the commentary that was reported in the ADN and in the podcast, Kathy Giesel, talking about how they needed to get the PFD issue under control. And this is it. If they if they placed this inside of a spending cap, that PFD issue would be under control forever because it, uh, as you said, it would become the major source of funding instead of, as Lyman Hoffman and others have pointed out, being the first call, uh, as it's supposed to be, and an even split between the people and the government, it would instead become the piggy bank. It would become the major funding source for all these pet projects. I mean, they, they're, looking to, they're looking to expand, you know, read any interview with any of the leadership in the Senate now, and you could tell they're looking to expand how much government spends. There's no discussion on anything else. It's all about how much government spends right now. Right. And it's, and it's K through 12. I mean, the K through 12 is sort of the, is sort of the lead. The mechanism. Uh, that, that, you know, that they're using to say, we need to, we need to have more spending. And then as we've talked before on the program, and as I'll talk about in the next segment, you sort of start lumping additional things in behind K through 12. Once you get that K through 12, bulwark or, or or that that beachhead uh, out there for spending then you're just going to start you know piling stuff in behind it and saying oh this is all relates to K through 12 it's all all important to K through 12 and and if you do this inside the you know again visualize the MMA ca cage match if you do this and in inside the inside the cage and you put the PFD in there they'll just keep you know well we got to spend on this we got to spend on that and and the way we've set up the spending cap it's all got to come out of the PFD now so you you can just see how they visualize eating away um, at the at the at the PFD by by doing that I, I you know I we need to point out <laughs> this trap because otherwise we're going to have people who are who get on board 
and say, oh, yeah, spending cap. Well, you know, we need to do more than spending cap, but let's go ahead and start with the spending cap um, uh, and and get that going because there seems to be support for it. Now the ADN supports it. Let's start with the spending cap and then we'll pick up these other things uh, as we go. Well, we'll never pick up those other things. I mean, we, we, no, we, that's, we, well, that's always well, the, hey, look at this hand. No, no, look at this hand. Oh, look at this hand. It's always, we'll do the one thing and we'll get to that other stuff later. And it never happens. That's why the fiscal policy working group said you have to take a holistic approach to everything at once. Oil taxes, sales taxes, revenue changes, cuts, and the PFD and expansion, everything. You have to look at it in total. You can't just say one thing in isolation because it never moves beyond that. Historical. I mean, this is not, we're not pontificating here. That's historical fact. Yeah, that was that that was the that was the issue that everybody that that others had with a PFD constitutional or, or have with a PFD constitutional amendment. Once you fix that, then then, you know, other things uh, uh, fall out of that. So it's it, the 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 working group had it right. Governor Dunleavy's FY 21 10 year plan had it right. You've got to do all this stuff together uh, in order for for for, you know, something not to get exposed as a, as the thing that takes uh that, that takes the burden and 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 this is a great example of that you know doing a doing a spending cap period nothing else and including the pfd inside the spending cap which is the which is the critical component that senator von imhoff pushed and that the adn editorials pushing uh that's i mean that that's a recipe for disaster it, it to the extent you value middle and lower income alaska families to the extent you value the role that the PFD plays in Alaska, in the Alaska economy. Uh, that's a, just a recipe for disaster. So, yeah, this ADN is a trying to set a, ADN trying to set a trap. Uh, uh, people need to be aware of it, uh, and uh, and and we don't need to we don't need others out there saying, oh, well, the ADN's endorsed it, so let's go down that road. Or well, right, this is Aurora 2.0, right? That was the name of her plan uh uh back in the day of von imhoff's plan was aurora 2.0 we'll take care of it all it'll be a spending cap don't worry trust me we know what to do with this better than you do right that's kind of the whole plan here yeah exactly right exactly well, right brad the powers that be um they just they keep coming back to the the the, the keep coming back to the well uh, I mean, right? It's the same thing over and over again. We, I mean, literally, I, I mentioned the eight-year mark here earlier because I was thinking about it last night, and I was thinking, you know, we've been saying similar things for so long. We've modified the argument a little bit. I mean, in the beginning, there was really almost no discussion between Brad and I on the preferred method of taxation. I mean, there was no discussion really of the flat tax and other things early on, because what we were trying to do is we were trying to get legislators to commit to holding the budget down to that $4 billion mark, 3.9, 4, $4.1 billion mark, because that was the level at which, uh, you know, ICER and ITEP and everybody else had said, this is the sustainable level that if you hold it here, you won't have these ungodly problems down the road. And it slowly changed. I mean... It, our arguments have basically always been pretty much the same, and yet we've continued to see, I mean, exactly what we predicted coming on over and over and over again, Brad. I mean, it sometimes I get a little tired, you know, of 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 making these arguments and watching all this stuff and being kind of right about everything that's happening. Yeah, the original Michael uh, was uh, 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 Scott Goldsmith's uh, sustainable budget model, uh, and and he calculated. Using the PFD, using the the other half, Hammond's other half, and and projecting out oil revenues and projecting out a number of things, projected what the, the sustainable level of spending could be uh, over time. It's a calculation you had to do every year, uh, and and it shifted between years. But but you could calculate out. You know, you could look over a ten year horizon or a fifteen year horizon or a twenty year horizon. Uh, and and calculate what the sustainable level of spending would be. And Scott said as early as 2009, he said, if we don't get spending down in a study that they were doing for something else, he said, if we don't get spending down by the early 2020s, what Alaska is going to be facing is taxation uh, because we're going to have outspent our means. We're going to have outspent the revenues that we have uh, from traditional sources. So that's what, that's what you and I talked about from, you know, well, what I talked about from 2011, 2012, 
uh, uh, on and what you and I talked about when we started doing uh, started doing the show together. It shifted in 2016. The the, the big shift was 2016 when Walker uh, uh, vetoed or 27. Well, I get confused between fiscal years and calendar years. But whenever Walker vetoed, uh, I guess it was 2016, vetoed uh, the PFD and and diverted a portion of the PFD to revenue, diverted a portion of it to support spending, right. that, that was the big shift. And what, what the discussion has been since, or what my discussion has been since, okay, if we're going to do that, if we're going to divert revenue, uh, then we need to evaluate what's the best revenue source to do that. Uh, you shouldn't just say, okay, well, we ran out, we ran out of savings too bad. Now we got to use uh, the PFD as the next, as the next crutch to continue to support spending. No, at that point, we need to evaluate what the best revenue source is. If we're going to continue spending like this. We need to evaluate what the best revenue source is. I mean, we, we could have, and, and to some degree we did, dig in our heels and say nothing beyond the sustainable spending level, period. End of, end of discussion. But, you know, as, as Dunleavy found in 2019, when he tried that approach uh, with the legislature, he just got run over and he hasn't tried it again since. And no one's really um, uh, tried it again since. So you can take that position. You can dig in your heels and say no more. But that's not that's not the reality of the situation we're in. It's not the reality of the of the environment we're in. We're in an environment where they're either going to use the PFD or they're going to use a portion of the PFD, divert a portion of the PFD, tax a portion of the PFD uh, to revenue. They're either going to do that or they're going to do something else. And and what we've talked about from 2017 on, I can still remember the article I wrote that started this um, uh, from 2017 on, is if you're going to do this, if you're going to have additional revenue to support this spending, if you're not going to get spending under control, if you're going to tax if, Alaskans, if you're right. going to tax Alaskans, essentially, right, then here's the type of revenue you ought to do. So, yeah, we started out. We started out with with Scott Goldsmith's sustainable budget model, and, and we talked about that for years and years and years and years, and 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 said, you know, look, Scott's told us this is where it's going. It's going to go to it's going to go to additional revenues. We need to dig in our heels. We need to get spending under control. Walker blew that out in 2016. Said, "Hey, we're not going to get spending under control. We're going to use revenue. We're going to create additional revenues," and um, and that's where we've been since. We've been in, in an additional revenue environment. And the question is, what's the best? If you're going to have additional revenues, what's the best additional revenue source for Alaska? And we've known since 2016. We actually knew before then, but it was at least captured in in two reports in 2016 and 2017. We've known since that time. That, that PFD cuts have the worst adverse right. impact, have the largest that adverse was, impact. That was a big part of the ISA report talking about of all the levers you could pull, this is the worst one. And uh, yep. and we focused on that as well. Well, that leads us into number two. Give us a tease. We'll we'll take a break here a minute earlier or so, but give us a tease for number two, which also includes the ADN. So the ADN has this long story, lead story on uh, on K through 12 and the importance of K through 12. Um, and it's 33 paragraphs long, which is a long story, uh, has a lot of quotes in it, uh, talks to a lot of uh, legislators, uh, uh, does a, a lot of analysis. But in 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 the in the in this entire 33 paragraphs, they leave out one thing, one thing. And that one thing is the entire other half of the story. And that is who pays for all this additional spending that uh, that all these legislators are uh, are talking about. Who who writes the checks? Who who takes the hit uh, for the additional spending? Entirely left out of the story. So we'll talk about what that means and 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 why that's an important half uh, that should be included in any story on K through twelve spending. We're on the weekly top three. We're moving on to number two, which is editorials and stories from the ADN where we only get, well, half the story, maybe. Uh, Brad uh, continues with us now. Brad, uh, the story uh, Alaska lawmakers say increasing education funding is the top priority. That's the headline of the story. And it just gives you a roadmap for where this session is going. Well, yeah. And it's, it's a, as I say, it's a long story. It's a feature story. And it quotes several legislators to say that uh, increase in K through 12 spending is inevitable. 
Uh, it's just a question of how much. And it quotes both Democrat law- lawmakers and Republican lawmakers, Justin Ruffridge from uh, the new, newly elected representative from, uh, from the Kenai. Uh, is quoted in there as saying essentially that it's just it's inevitable that we're going to have increased K through 12 spending. Uh, it's just a question of how much, and the how and and so you know really can builds I, the. Can I interrupt for just a second because we had Justin on the program uh, on uh, on uh, last last week, and I specifically asked him about the education funding, and he said, "Well, he said it might be a possibility, but the problem is, and he admitted that the system is fundamentally broken and flawed, and we need to address that as well. It's interesting, and I don't know if he's just saying one thing to my audience and something else to the ADN's audience, or if they took just one sentence of his answer out of context or something. Uh, we're going to have to watch that because he admitted that the system is fundamentally broken and that more money, just raw more money is not going to fix the problem. But when I saw that quote from him, I was interested because he had just been on the program talking about how we can't just throw more money at the problem and expect different results. Yeah. Well, people will rationalize that, that, you know, we're going to spend more money and we'll, and we'll have to make some additional distance additions uh, to the system. But if we make those additional addis- additions to the system, they're willing to spend more money on it. I, I, the gist of the, the gist of the article is is we're going to have additional K through 12 spending, um, and you hear that you hear that not only out of the House, you hear that out of the Senate, uh, the new the new Senate uh, majority uh, that's going to be additional K through 12 spending. The, the real question is how much. I mean, you can have an increase in the BSA, uh, uh, and that's and that's one thing. But then when you read the article, you you see the additional pieces coming in. You see the additional pieces about teacher retention. Uh, and about the need for defined benefits to apply to teachers, uh, and about uh, uh, you know additional support for capital budgets for schools. So you, so you, you, maybe maybe a good analogy is a boat leaving a wake. Right, the the head of the boat is the the beginning of the wake. Is we need additional we need an addition of the BSA to account for inflation uh, over the past few years. That seems to be the beginning point of this argument. And then, and then, as the boat passes and the wake gets bigger and bigger, you see more things being piled in, uh, like uh, the defined benefit program and like the capital budget. And, and 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 once we go down the defined benefit program, once we start down that, and you include K through 12 in the defined benefit program, then you're going to see other state employees say, "Oh well, we need to be part of that as well because we have, you know, look at what's going on with the with the Medicaid division and look at what's going on with with other divisions. We need additional employees as well. We need additional retention." Uh, we need to define benefit for those as well. So it, it's it's just, I mean, the, the article leaves you with the impression that it's just a question of how big the wake's going to be. We're going to have some additional spending in this area. Uh, the question is going to be how how big the wake's, uh, the wake's going to be. But here's the thing. In the entire 33 paragraphs of the article, there's not one mention of, of how they're going to, how they pay for this additional spending or who uh, bears the burden uh, of the additional spending. It's it's either you, you're you're left with the impression it's either just assumed that it's going to come from the PFD or or nobody's just really thought of that issue yet. We're just going to set all this spending out there, uh, and then we'll worry about how we're going to pay for it. To how we're going to pay for it later on, and that to me, that who pays, where the money's going to come from, and who's going to pay that money, is as big a question as anything else. Because it, as 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 whether you spend it in the first place, because who pays the revenue source has a huge impact on on both Alaska families and on the Alaska economy. You take it out of the PFD and you're taking it directly out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. The top 20 percent are going to are going to dodge. They're just going to go. They're going to be on the outside of the cage match uh, that uh, that we were talking about in the first segment. Um, you take it, you take it though, you, you use a broad based tax and everybody's going to contribute to it. Everybody's going to feel the pain. Everybody's going to have the incentive to push back into, and, and to limit the spending to, to reasonable levels. You take it out of the PFD only out of middle and lower income Alaska families and the top 20% have a, have a free shot. They can say, oh no, we need to spend more. We need to have these defined benefit programs. We need to include other state employees. Uh, in the defined benefit programs and push for a bigger and bigger and bigger program, a bigger and bigger, bigger wake um, in the sense that I was talking about it 
uh, before, and they don't have to pay. It's a free shot for them. So it, right. it, the, 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 the source of the funds is as important from the standpoint of, of the impact on Alaskans, Alaska families and the Alaska economy and Alaskans overall, the source of the funds is as important as where you're going to spend the funds. And I just, it, 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 one thing you tell, you tell journalism students is don't report half a story, report the whole story, get quotes from both sides, present the arguments of both sides, um, uh, you know, sort educate the educate the 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 reader, and here they've just left out a half, an entire half uh, of the story about where uh, where that uh, where those funds are going to come from and what the impact of those those funds are. Maybe maybe they'll do another story later on it. Maybe not, but you're you're not Alaskans are not getting readers are not getting a full understanding of the impact of this legislation until. They're also told and also educated on 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 the impacts of where the dollars come from and and who's going to pay and who's going to pay those dollars. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're talking about the weekly top for two. Again, is as he just pointed out, only getting half the information from the uh, from the local news media on this issue. Uh, Brad, final thoughts on this before we move on to number three. Well, I think it's I think it's absolutely critical that that we have that we have a discussion of who pays. And part of the part of the problem may be we may not have legislators stepping up and saying, "Hey, it's important also to consider who pays uh, for for these additional funds." And I, to the extent that we have legislators listening, I would encourage them if they ever get contacted about these stories, who say for them to respond by saying, "Look, half the story is what you want to spend it on; the other half." an equal half a co-equal half is is who you who's going to be spending uh, uh who's going to be the source of these additional funds you want to spend and so so we have legislators raising that issue uh as well uh let's get on to number three which is a story about uh some disputes over facilities up on the slope and what does this do for us and what does it mean for alaska uh, this is about a suit that Conoco Phillips is uh, putting forward. We've talked about the dispute between uh, Oil Search and Conoco before. Uh, that that's now matured into this lawsuit. The dispute is over access by Oil Search or now Santos, uh, the developers of the Pika project, access by them to roads that surface roads that Conoco has built. Uh, in its uh, in its area to service its uh, its uh, 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 service its facilities, you want as small a footprint on the north slope as you possibly can have. Uh, some of the Conoco roads could be useful in getting to a portion of the Pika properties, uh, and not not require the duplication of roads. And Pika has asked for not require the expense or the or the impact on the environment or the additional permitting that would that would be required for additional roads. And so oil search has been pressing for access to these roads by Conoco. Conoco offered the roads, but at, but at a fairly high price. Um, uh, and uh, and Pika took that took the dispute to the Department of Natural Resources. Department of Natural Resources found that oil search can have access to the Conoco roads uh, to get to their property. Roads built and maintained by Conoco to get to the to get to the oil search properties. Um, and now Conoco is taking that DNR decision to court. We've been here. We've been here before. In the early 2000s, uh, one of one of my uh, bread and butter disputes, as I, I had as a lawyer, was a dispute between uh, various uh, uh, new producers, new entrants on the North Slope, and the incumbents about access to various facilities. The only facilities that are that that the producers are required to give access to third parties to are the major trunk pipelines on the North Slope. Those operate as common carriers and, and third parties can have, have access to those pipelines. But everything else on the slope, field lines, field uh, 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 facilities, processing facilities, all that sort of stuff, uh, uh, you have to negotiate uh, for access. And it really, it bogs down the system. I mean, new and new new players don't know if they're going to be able to get access, don't know if they're going to have to try to permit duplicate facilities, which they probably wouldn't be able to do. They don't know what the cost is 
of accessing the existing facilities on the slope. So it really slows down the process of development up there. In, in the early 2000s, there was a white paper that the Department of Natural Resources did that said we ought to have rules for sharing facilities. We ought to, we ought to lay out the, both that the, the third parties can have access and the economic terms and conditions under which they can have access. Um, we haven't done that yet, so we continue to have these sorts of disputes. Well, because it makes no sense to have to rebuild a road parallel to another road that's already there, but you don't want it to be priced out of the market where exploration or development can't happen. And so well, I you, think you, you couldn't get a second road permitted. That's that's sort of the real problem. Exactly. Once you've got a road, that's it. I can understand having a set amount where, you know, uh, oil search has to pay a portion, but we've seen this in the past. Conoco in the past has done similar things in the past where they've priced out. Uh, they've shut out small fields that couldn't get their oil into the main pipeline. Uh, and they've shut out small fields to the point to where the smaller producers basically throw their hands up in the air and then Conoco acquires a new smaller field and things like that, pricing things out, especially when you can't build more infrastructure. I mean, at that point, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of, you know, government stepping in, but at some point they got to set some rules that says, okay, look, you can charge, you know, within this price range, but not pricing it basically out so that nothing pencils out and becomes economically feasible. We need the development in the state. Yeah, there, there's a there's a balance here. I mean, Conoco invested the money uh, in building these roads. They sized the roads uh, to to their needs, ne not necessarily the needs their needs plus somebody else. Um, and and so there's there's a there they've made an investment, and we ought to respect the investment. But there's a there's a counterbalance, and that is that you know you're not going to get additional facilities permitted. You're not going you're not going to get duplicative facilities permitted. You're not going to get uh, 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 the economics of, of some of these smaller fields, the development economics of some of these smaller fields to work if they can't piggyback on top of existing facilities uh, that are out there. And there and there's this balance. Here, when, when somebody called, when Alex DeMarvin from ADN called and asked me for a, a comment on, on the Conoco uh, oil search dispute, my response was, it's DNR's fault. I mean, we've known since the early 2000s that we have these disputes. Um, and we know that these disputes can 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 result in slowing down, if not killing, uh, additional development on the North Slope, third party and independent new entrant development on the North Slope. So we've known these disputes are out there. We ought to have rules that govern it. I mean, there is a balance. The rules ought to take that balance into account. They ought to say that, you know, if you build a road or you build a facility, um, you get, you know, priority access to it and somebody else has to sort of work around your schedule as opposed to, you know, giving up a portion of the benefit that you, that why you invested in the road or the size you, you made on the road. There ought to be a balance to it, but we ought to have rules. We ought not to have this be a situation in which every time this, the, this dispute comes up, it's like, you know, somebody's just invented the world again and we've got to go through this dispute process and then we've got to go through complaints to DNR and then we've got to go through court appeals and and everything's got to stay in limbo and everything's got to sort of, you know, uh, uh, be held up pending the re resolution of it. We ought to have rules that that DNR sets up and the rules ought to, ought to be balanced and they ought to take into account the interests of both the incumbents and the and the new entrants. But there ought to be rules so that so that when these disputes come up, We've got a place to go. We've got a place to resolve it quickly, fairly, in a balanced fashion, and move on with it, and 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 keep development going as opposed to slowing it down. It's just, I mean, we've been here before. I lived I lived through this in the in the late 1990s, early 2000s. We've been here. We know it's an issue. We had a white paper that said let's develop rules that deal with this, and then we didn't uh, because the because the dispute sort of went away. Uh, and now, now they're back and now we're, you know, doing this all over again, uh, when we shouldn't be. And it's important. It's important from the standpoint of development, because you want new entrants to know that they have the security of being able to, to develop their property if they find something. Right. Like, we don't want people in boardrooms saying, well, I'd develop, I'd, I'd invest in Alaska, but I don't know, even if I find something, I'll, if I'll ever be able to get it out. We want them to know that they're going to be able to do that on terms and conditions that are fair. You know what the terms and conditions are. You factor it into your development plan and you go forward. Uh, having Letting this all just be resolved by dispute whenever it shows up, uh, I think is just sort of the worst way uh, 
uh, to do this. So now that it's shown up again, hopefully we will, hopefully we'll go forward and, uh, and we'll get some rules. So it doesn't happen yet another time down the road. Well, and this is something the administration could take on on their own. I mean, like you said, there's already been a white paper that outlines, you know, how this could work and how these rules could be laid out. There's nothing to say that the administration uh, and the DNR under this administration couldn't put those rules forward and and put it together and create a framework to avoid potential future conflicts. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, we, we don't we don't we don't need this stuff going off to court. We don't need this stuff taking time. We don't need a bunch of money being spent on legal proceedings when we could just you know <coughs> have a set of rules and deal with it from that. So it's I it's it was time to do that in the early 2000s. We got close, we never completed it. This administration I think does need to complete it and get a basic set of rules down so we don't we don't impede new developments by uh, by these sorts of disputes. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. But Brad, what are you looking for into next week, do you think? I mean, we're going to start. Your next top three is going to be the first day of the session. Uh, are you looking at the formation of the majorities? I mean, what are you what are you looking at here for next week's top three? Uh, pre-files. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start working through the pre-files. I didn't do that uh, uh, when they first came out. There's another batch of pre-files that are going to come, uh, and I'll start looking at uh, start looking at those. Um, and, and certainly from the standpoint of, of those pre-files that deal with fiscal issues or deal with, uh, deal with oil issues. I'm also going to talk, I'm also going to be digging into a little bit, uh, uh, what department of revenue is doing about, uh, about looking at alternative revenue sources are, are part of my concern is the Dunleavy administration is responsible for PFD cuts because they're not putting forward alternatives to, to PFDs. I mean, they're saying this is spending and we're not in, and we're going to have pie in the sky revenues that are unrealistic. And so they're leaving the only alternative being the PFD. So part of what I'm doing this coming week is looking at what the Department of Revenue is doing on, on digging into alternative revenues. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thanks for coming on board. Um, as always, an interesting discussion. Michael, as always, uh, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.